Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. Please stand by for Robert Wenzel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. I'm Robert Wenzel. Today, my guests are Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick. Oliver Stone, the Academy Award winning director of such great movies as Wall Street, Platoon, and JFK, and yes, Peter Kuznick co-author of a new book Oliver Stone has out called The Untold History of the United States. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, Robert. Guys, I want to tell you, it's a fascinating book. There's parts in there that I agree with and other parts that I don't, but I think it's a great book to create discussion in the United States as to what the history of the United States is really all about. The places where I think you're the weakest are in finance and economics, where I'm quite familiar with those areas. So I'm going to question you a little bit more on those than the foreign policy things, where you've got some important points. Let me point out, for example, that you do indicate that the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not necessary. You've got some great stuff in there on the growing surveillance state. And the fact that President Obama has been working with crony capitalists, at least in the first administration, it looks like he's meeting with Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs, so looks like things haven't changed too much there. You point out the problems with the drone program. So with current stuff, I've got to say you're right on as far as foreign policy, surveillance state, as far as I'm concerned. But first, Oliver, I've got to ask you a question on the JFK movie. I've always been curious about this. Did anybody ever put any pressure on you in any way to change part of the movie or even stop that movie from being produced? No, the film seems to hold well together. In fact, there's been a lot more work done in that field by people who independently. It's always been an independently private kind of an enterprise. And there's some new books coming out. James Douglas wrote a great one on JFK. And David Talbot wrote something called Brothers. And there's some new research going on, too, based on the Assassination Board Records Review. It's a fertile field, but at least by getting into the... Uh, the records, which was important. We started the process where other things were discovered. Yeah. See, I think you opened up not only the JFK assassination situation, but the whole conspiracy thing, which brings me to my next question in your movie about 9-11. The topic you chose, in a way, I, I felt it really was like a, in a way, like a cock block where once it was announced that Oliver Stone is doing a movie on 9-11, it may have stopped a lot of other projects. And although your movie was good from a dramatic point of view, it really didn't get into, you know, why it happened. And No, it was no intention to be a, what you call a cock block. <laughs> no, the, in fact, the script was originally written by uh, Andrea Berlander. We did very well all around the world, but it was always intended to be. Well, two men, John McLaughlin and Will Emino. Mm -hmm. And they were actually lived this incredible story. There were only 20 survivors in that whole building, so very dramatic. And... I wasn't, frankly, at that time in 2006, able to contemplate the whole thing. It was too early. And, you know, the idea is go right in and take a anti view of this uh, microscopic view of what happened to the men and people inside and the heroism they showed. There was a film that made at the same time and they came out ahead of us. It was about the airplane in Pennsylvania. That was made at the same time and that came out and did very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I noticed still, even in this book, I get the sense you're, you're not committed one way or another, whether there was any type of conspiracy. You know, you have to realize I did it once with JFK, and really, I feel like this book is really about essential positive ideas and about what went wrong and end times and what can go right in America. And the alternatives is what Peter and I present. Right. The alternatives being from World War II on, you know. The book starts earlier than the series, the Chief Woodrow Wilson and Philippine War of 1900. But basically, Peter is a scholar who's been doing this for 40 years. I'm a dramatist, and I'm, we've joined forces to try to visualize this and try to make it simpler for kids at teenage level and above to understand our history. They're getting an unbalanced history in school. Mm -hmm. True, I agree. Let me ask you a question about you and Peter. How did the two of you get together? How long do you know each other, and how did the project come up? Peter, you want to say it for me? Back in 1996, I started teaching a class at American University called Oliver Stone's America which was a course that dealt with history and film and interpretations. 
and Oliver's films are great for covering almost every aspect of U.S. history as feature films from 1945 through the present. So I started doing that, and Oliver came in as a guest speaker that first year that I taught it, after which we went out for dinner and started talking about history, and I laid out a scenario to him that I thought would make a great movie about the 1944 to 46 period, beginning with the atomic bombing and showing how close Henry Wallace, who was Roosevelt's vice president from 1941 to 45, how close he came to being vice president again in 1944, and then he would have become president in 1945 when Roosevelt died. And what we show there is he really comes within seconds of getting the vice presidential nomination again. Claude Pepper got within five feet of the microphone at the Democratic Party convention in 1944. Had he gotten Wallace's name and nomination that night, Wallace would have been back on the ticket as vice president and then uh, would have become president. And what I showed Oliver that night was that had that happened, there would have almost certainty that there would have been no atomic bombing in 1945, and there's also a very good chance that there would have been no Cold War. So Oliver really appreciated that idea dramatically as well as historically, and that became a basis for something that we try to collaborate on then, but it, the idea kept on coming up in our conversations over the years, and then we were having dinner together in 2007, and we decided we were going to go ahead and do a documentary initially about Henry Wallace and the atomic bomb. But the idea evolved very, very quickly into this 10-part documentary film series. And then two years into that process, we decided we were going to do a book to go along with it to give enormous amount of evidence and depth that we couldn't do in 10 hours in the documentary. Robert, what you said at the beginning of the show was very complimentary. You may not agree with everything, but my God, you know, you, that's what the whole point of the book is to open a debate, open a discussion with teachers, with students. And how this reevaluated, we haven't reevaluated American mission and how we got to where we are. We always get the news. Every day we get to some new crisis. We're always running around. Some new country comes up. This is a very rare look at how this all evolved and this concept of the military industrial complex came into being. And you as an economist who I'm sure appreciates the concept of waste and using your dollars well, I mean, that's part of the economy. We have not used it well, and we betrayed our economy on several occasions, whether it was during the Vietnam War, you know, the economy. And then after the war, it was the 1970s, there was a slump on that war, and then there was another slump in 1987 with Reagan, there was another slump with Bush. Yeah, I think your book and Peter's book is really important in doing that revisionist history and get people to focus on, hey, things might be different, in much the way your JFK film did, and basically... You know, people can take it from there and make comments, and but it's something to move off of. We've got something here. Now I'm going to go in the direction of moving off and targeting some of your financial and economic comments where I think more work needs to be done. For example, in the book, you guys state that repeal of the Glass-Steagall precipitated the financial crisis. How do you see Glass-Steagall precipitating the financial crisis? Peter, do you want to take that one? Oliver is actually more of an economist than I am. Oh, okay. Well, go ahead, Oliver. Look, I think what Peter says and keeps harping on, and I think it's really important, is the gap that's developed in America between the, the rich, the very rich, and the, uh, the majority of people. Or we had the decimation of the working class and or called middle class during these last 32 years. And I think we attribute the causes of this to the neglect of the middle class and over-involvement in foreign affairs and especially interventions. We have spent a fortune on the foreign wars, but not enough to rebuild America. And this is a, a theme we hit on several times because it comes up again and again as we pay a heavy price for our foreign adventure. And now we have secret bases. We have all kinds of drone activity. We have space weaponry. We are up to our ass in weaponry. We are armed to the teeth and we're scared. We're scared of terrorism. Yeah. We're scared of our paranoias. But it doesn't make any economic sense. glass diesel yeah, I mean, that is an issue. You, I know the other argument because I heard it, but Certainly, it was what happened when I was on doing Wall Street in the 1980s. I, I did notice that the Gordon Geckos were the outlaws. They were the glamorized outlaws who were making big money, money that had never been dreamed of before. When my father was a softball player. In the 80s, it all changed. But when I went back to do Wall Street with Money Never Sleeps in 2010, I was shocked because now the Gordon Geckos have become the banks. The banks changed their role from 1980s to 2010. Peter? We're talking about the growing influence of Wall Street 
in the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administration, and the fact that the people who had pushed deregulation the hardest, many of them were the people around Robert Rubin during the Clinton administration, and those were the people who came back in as Obama's advisors, which is why we're not surprised that they have such Wall Street-friendly policies. And those who did away with Glass-Steagall were folks who were around Rubin. The New York Times refers to the Obama's economic advisors as a constellation of Rubenites. We're talking about Geisner, Summers, Orsag, and those are the same people who push the deregulation. I do not question that Rubin's people are throughout the Obama administration. My point is, and this is important for me, because you sort of pin part of the blame on the financial crisis on Glass-Steagall. And basically, my problem with that is, what Glass-Steagall did is put up that wall between commercial banks and investment bankers. But the financial crisis, the two firms that went down, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, were investment bankers. They had no commercial business at all. They've since changed their structure, but they're still pretty much investment banks and certainly were at that time. That had nothing to do with Glass-Steagall. The crash, the crisis would have occurred even if Glass-Steagall was maintained. Aren't you overlooking Citigroup? Citigroup, that's, remember, that's where Rubin went. And Citigroup had a reason because they acquired Smith Barney and were doing investment banking from that angle. But... The crisis would have occurred because you had the problem with Lehman Brothers and you had the problem with Bear Stearns and then Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley had to be bailed out. That would have happened even if Glass-Steagall was maintained and Citigroup was not allowed to play with Lehman Brothers. The ones that collapsed that started the whole thing were Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and they had no commercial bank. They had nothing to do with Glass-Steagall at all and neither the Goldman Sachs, which was bailed out in, in Morgan Stanley. You're talking about the two banks. But, you know, frankly, it's a much bigger collapse than that. It was a collapse of psychology and fear. And the working class people realized that the banks are much more interested in making their own profits than caring about their clients. So there's been a whole change. And it's a psychological change in the landscape. It's not just about two bank family. It's about a letdown. And pension funds across the board of what the U.S. economy is supposed to be productive, not capitalistic in the sense of making profit for profit's sake, but for investing in a productive economy. That was the way I grew up. My father taught me that. And that was the way Wall Street used to work. Right, but, but a lot of that has to do with the cronyism that goes on now between parts of Wall Street and the government. I mean, basically what you have is the government protecting these guys. Only the Wall Street bankers have been the greediest. They've been the new superstructure. From, we're talking about the age of the 1890s or coming back, 1880. This is the, the 400, the Gilded Age it was called. Yeah, but that's a long, long debate. The current situation, you wouldn't have people putting money in with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and people like that if they thought at all they had serious substantial risk and they would look at their investments a lot closer. And but they played them to the client several times. That's just taking a position on a trade. Brokerage firms do that all day long. That is not an argument against a brokerage firm. If I'm a brokerage firm and some guy tells me he wants to invest in cheese-making equipment for a flight to the moon and uh, he's willing to pay the fees, who am I to say he's not going to be able to get the equipment up there and make lots of cheese? You know, it's that's the position of a broker is to raise the money and let other people determine whether they want to invest in something like that. Let's move on. I'm also curious about the economists you quote in the book. You quote Robert Reich and Paul Krugman, and I'm not sure they're the best guys to quote with regard to the financial history of the United States. Why did you pick Paul Krugman, for example? And either one of you can take that. You have a bug up about this. <laughs> I know a lot of people, but you know, I, we respect them. And you know what? Those people they never got a chance to do it their way. Why, you know, why did Geithner come in? Why couldn't we have put Sheila Bear or uh, Wolf Stiglitz, for that matter, as Secretary of the Treasury? Why couldn't we take a new approach to this situation? Why do we have to go the old way? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting about Geithner. Let me ask you this. Did you know that Geithner's father was a senior supervisor for Obama's mother way back when she was in Indonesia? Uh, no. <laughs> that news even appeared in the New York Times. It was a buried story, but Timothy Geithner's father worked for the Ford Foundation and supervised microfinance for all of Asia, while President Obama's mother was in charge of microfinance for Indonesia. And we've got a, a pension magazine that points out they met once, and we don't know how many other times, but Oliver, you got a movie there. It's a conspiracy theory. My point is, I mean, it's a fascinating connection. You brought up how did Geithner get in there and this curious connection going way back between Geithner's father and Obama's mother. 
But anyways, back to Krugman. Krugman, you say you respect the guy. What about the guy do you respect other than he writes for, you know, the New York Times? No, it's uh, hardly a New York Times. Krugman's always, to me, I mean, I look, I'm not an expert, but I do believe in his stimulus theory. I don't believe that this adversity, uh, cutting the debt is a solution. We have to take a Roosevelt policy about this and spend money. We have to prime the pump. There's too much capital out that's doing nothing, sitting in corporations doing nothing. Capital has to serve people. That's what the economy is about. And these corporations are hoarding the capital. They're complaining about a regulatory climate, etc. This is the old Roosevelt versus the New Deal battle versus the Republican businessmen. You stand for the people. Yeah. You know, I don't want to turn this into too much of a technical show or anything like that, but it doesn't really matter how much money corporations or individuals hoard. The prices are set based on supply and demand on the money that is being spent out there. So... I'm going to put Paul Krugman on with you, okay? <laughs> uh, hey, we're trying to get him on the show. I respect him. We can move on. At one point, you say in the book, it's too bad that Lyndon Baines Johnson had to focus so much on the Vietnam War because he couldn't get the great society started that he wanted to. That shook me because a lot of problems we have right now are because of things started by LBJ and the great society. Medicare, Medicaid, economic opportunity, higher education. Those are some of the good things that this country has done. In the late 1930s, we came very close to having a national health program. The Wagner Act that was introduced in the end of 1938 actually would have given the United States a national health program far more substantial than what we've got now under Obamacare. It's to us very instructive that we used to be able to say that there were two countries in the world that didn't have a national health program, the United States and South Africa. But right now, South Africa has a national health program. The United States is the only country that does it. Isn't it outrageous that we have so many people in this country who have no access to health care and have no insurance, no coverage at all, have to go into the, at best, go to emergency rooms? So I, so I think that Medicare and Medicaid were at least two steps in the right direction. And it was tragic because Johnson's real commitment, his passion, was about social change at home. But he was willing to sacrifice that because of his fear of losing a war in Vietnam. But Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, the Higher Education Act, all this came in under Johnson. He started it. And these are where our problems right now. The greatest debt problems the United States government has are in these areas started by Johnson. Every other country in the world afford national health care except the United States. Are we so impoverished as a country or do we just have our priorities upside down? Well, my argument to that is what happens when you put government in charge of so much medical solutions, government has to decide where that money is going to go. Your book is all about elitists getting in and controlling foreign policy. What happens when they get in and control the medical situation the way they are now? Prices for medical services, as we all know, are going through the roof. They're not going up for cell phones, for televisions, anything in the free market, what's going on with the internet. It's, it's where the government is because the cronies get in there. So why you would want to put government in charge of more stuff so the cronies can get at it? We know big farmers getting at it. We know big health insurance is getting at it. It's going to be a disaster. It's going to eventually lower the medical standards of the United States, lower the life expectancy, and uh, it's socialist intervention. I think you're misidentifying the problem in the United States. The problem is that the United States has a bigger gap between rich and poor than any other country in the world. The problem is that the six Walmart heirs have more wealth than the poorest 30% of Americans. You need to be focusing on this tremendous disparity that's evolved and has gotten so much worse in the past few years. The gap between rich and poor in the United States is absolutely enormous. Sure, but that problem comes about because of the crony capitalism, which makes it almost impossible in many industries for new competitors to come in. You can't become a stockbroker right now. There's a broker out there by the name of Peter Schiff who wanted to go over 50 stockbrokers and he was fined for increasing the number of stockbrokers he wanted. It's locked up. The crony guys have it locked up. That's why they're getting richer and no one else is. That's the problem. You know, there's, there's reasons behind these numbers. There are other reasons too. During the time of our greatest post-war prosperity, during the Eisenhower administration, we had a 91% top tax rate. Even when Reagan took office, the highest income tax rate was 70%. Reagan lowered that to 28%. I mean, there are very important reasons that the game has been tilted in favor of the very, very wealthy against the majority of Americans. 
And so those policies are the ones that we're very, very critical of. Well, the actual tax rate was not 91%. The highest rate was 91%. Was even lower. So we're not suggesting raising it to 91%, but we think well, that I'm the relieved. rich should be paying a fair share. Okay, let me ask you a question. You mentioned Bernard Baruch a number of times in your book. And I'm just curious, why didn't you bring up the big gold scam that Bernard Baruch ran? Why didn't we? Yeah. We're focusing on different parts of Baruch's legacy. For the story that we're telling, our book is almost 800 pages. We had to cut 200 pages to get it down to 800 pages. We could have written three more volumes of untold history mm -hmm. that were very interesting and important. Right. So you can point to a lot of things that we would like to have talked about that we didn't talk about. But we're telling a different story. We're telling a story about American empire and the national security state. I'm afraid that your listeners will have almost no idea of what our book and our documentaries are about because you're picking on certain issues that actually occupy maybe one two hundredth or less of what we're talking about in this book. But Baruch is a very important player when it comes to America's nuclear policy, central to our argument. Baruch was put in charge of the Atchison Lilienthal Plan when it was taken to the United Nations in 1946. And at that point, all of the people who were involved in that, from Oppenheimer on down, Atchison, Lilienthal, Oppenheimer, all those who were hoping for an international control of nuclear weapons was so disappointed that Baruch was put in charge because Baruch's idea was not to have a, an honest agreement with the Soviets in 1946 to get rid of all nuclear weapons. It was to make the United States have as big an advantage as possible. And so that's why we talk about Baruch in that context, because Baruch sabotaged this really brilliant plan that was supported by liberals like Oppenheimer, as well as conservatives like Atchison, for actually getting rid of nuclear weapons. And that's something that's troubled us ever since. It's the fact that several people in the world have a veto power over the future existence of the human species is really outrageous. And we trace that history back from the very, very beginning. I agree. I think Baruch was a very, very bad guy. And you focused in the book on the nuclear situation, how that developed around uh, Baruch. But also, you know, the fact that FDR decided to confiscate gold and then Baruch and John Maynard Keynes both load up on gold mining stocks and egg FDR into propping up gold stocks when everything else was falling, I think is just as bad and shows how evil of a guy Baruch was. I mean, who would have bought a gold mining stock after FDR confiscated all the gold? But Baruch and Keynes both did. They both talked to FDR and they got him to prop up the price. Keynes even wrote an editorial in the New York Times urging FDR to prop up the gold price. I mean, these guys are schemers and elitist and dangerous guys. So um, I was just a little disappointed you didn't include that in the book. Now, one more thing with FDR, you also mentioned that the economy started to boom during the uh, World War II period. So I'm just curious why you didn't bring in any of the work by Robert Higgs, where he talks about what really went on as far as the economy in the United States during World War II. Which, is, of course, is a great irony, because the Communist Party during the war was supporting the no-strike pledge. <laughs> and, it w and it was the other labor leaders who were opposed to communism who were actually behind the strike wave. The Communist Party was trying to do everything it could to make sure that the United States, combined with the Soviets, won the war. It's interesting to us. One of the themes we touch on our first episode of the documentaries is about World War II. And what we're trying to point out there, which most Americans don't know, is that it wasn't the United States who won the war in Europe. It was the Soviet Union who won the war in Europe. The United States lost approximately 310,000 people during World War II in combat. The Soviets lost 27 million people in the war. The United States and the British faced 10 German divisions combined throughout most of the war, while the Soviets were facing 200 German divisions through 1944. And so there's a history of World War II, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, that Americans don't know. Not only did the Soviets win in the European front, but in a certain ironic sense, the Soviets also won the war against Japan. What most Americans don't realize, most Americans buy into this myth that what ended World War II in the Pacific was the atomic bomb. But Oliver and I show very, very clearly in this week's episode on Showtime, as well as in the book, was that the thing that changed the equation at the end of World War II in the Pacific was not the atomic bomb. The United States had already been wiping out cities. We had firebombed over a 100 Japanese cities. But what ended World War II was the Soviet invasion, 
which undermined not only Japan's diplomatic strategy for getting better surrender terms, but it also undermined Japan's military strategy for waiting for an American invasion and inflicting heavy casualties to get better surrender terms. Once the Soviets invaded and destroyed the Kwantung army almost overnight, the Japanese had no hope at all for anything other than surrendering. And they had a choice then. They could either surrender to the Russians, who would have no interest in allowing them to keep the emperor, or they could surrender to the Americans, where there was at least a chance they could keep the emperor. And in fact, one of the tragic things about this was that after people told Truman, his advisors kept telling him, change the surrender terms, let the Japanese know they can keep the emperor so we can end this war sooner. And Truman kept refusing to do so. Finally, after the war is over, the United States does let the Japanese keep the emperor. And as Secretary of War Stimson says, we have to do that. It's in our national interest in order to maintain peace and stability there. Well, we also point out the number of strikes during World War II because corporations uh, did not profit like they did in World War I, true. But the workers, their wages were frozen and led to enormous disturbance, which actually had a lot to do with what happened in our foreign policy after the war because any labor troubles were always attributed to some degree by the capitalists who owned the show to communism. Mm -hmm. Okay, getting back to your original point, I mean, you're absolutely right about the communists being in favor of production and people going to work in the United States, and that was because they realized that production requires people working, and when you're on strike, that doesn't happen, and the United States was running Lend-Lease and getting military equipment to the Soviet Union at that time. So I think the communists understand that strikes prohibit that production. But anyways, let me close with a question for Oliver and Peter, if you want to jump in on this one also. Oliver, Peter, where do you see the country going, given the surveillance state domestically and drones internationally? Are you guys optimistic at all, or what, what do you see? I don't know if we would say that we're optimistic, but we're hopeful. We haven't given up. We haven't given up on this country. We haven't even given up on Obama. We're, as you know, we're harshly, harshly critical of Obama. But we also see the way people change in office, especially during second term. Look at uh, Lincoln. You know, Lincoln is cert was certainly not an abolitionist when he took office. By the time he's assassinated, he's fighting for black rights and civil rights in a way that he certainly was not committed to when he first took office. Look at John Kennedy. We have a lot about jo John Kennedy. Kennedy comes into office as a real hardline cold warrior. But after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he undergoes a Damascus Road conversion, basically. And he's trying to end the Vietnam War. He's trying to end the space race. He wants to end the Cold War. He wants to pull the United States. I mean, he's got a, an approach that was fundamentally different from his approach in the beginning. So we think that there is hope. But we are certainly deeply concerned about many of the things that Obama has done. He has not defended civil liberties. He was a professor of constitutional law. We expected him to be a civil libertarian. Yep. He promised that his administration was going to be transparent. It's been anything but transparent. I mean, he's in fact, in many ways, not only doubled down on what Bush did, he's gone beyond that. We were very critical during the Bush administration that he was conducting national surveillance without judicial review. Obama has gone beyond that, and he's actually conducting targeted assassinations without judicial review. The drone program to us is very, very troubling, in many ways abhorrent, and there's nobody overlooking Obama on this. He's got the authority and power, he claims, to be judge, jury, and executioner. He's continuing the war in Afghanistan. He says we're going to be pulling out by 2014, but uh, it's clear that they're conducting these studies about how many troops they're going to keep there. 5,000, 10,000, 20,000? We don't know. That's not what we call ending the war. The United States has between 800 and 1,000 bases around the world, in addition to our carrier groups. The United States is still trying to dominate the world in ways that we think is very, very unhealthy. Uh, Oliver mentioned our Asia pivot, that Hillary Clinton has an article in Foreign Policy magazine called America's Pacific Century. So our militarism that we're so critical of of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, is going to be increasing and continuing into the 21st century. We envision a very, very different kind of role for the United States. So for all of those reasons, the point of our project is to spark a national discussion. 
It's to get people thinking, to get people talking, to get people seeing alternatives, looking at history in a different way so that they can think of the future in a different way. And that's really what we're trying to do. And we think that if we can spark that kind of movement and we can give more wind to the Occupy movement and, and to other progressive movements for change and anti-war movements, that maybe Obama will be pushed in the direction of making the kind of changes that we'd like to see to end this imperial stance that the United States has and to dismantle this national security state. Your concern about militarism, I'm right on line with you. The economic area, we see things a little bit differently, but discussion's important. That's what this book, The Untold History of the United States by Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick, opens up, and that's important. Oliver, any new movies uh, on the horizon? Well, this is choky dry. <laughs> this, we're still finishing the work, uh, chapters 9 and 10, which are coming up in January. So uh, I uh, need a little bit of a break. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll see you at Skybar. I ran into you a few years back. <laughs> well, actually, I crashed your table. You were there with Jim Brown. Long story, you were with some Czechoslovak twins. Long story. <laughs> I remember it. There's no reason for you to remember it. Good story. Say hello next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Good night. Yeah, Sorry. same here. Take care, guys. Thank you, Robert. Okay, now let's bring in Chris Rossini and let's do the Rossini wrap up. Chris, what did you think? Very good interview. I enjoyed it. What I really like about Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick is they like to question the official line that Americans are fed. I'm all for that. They basically see problems, militarism, Wall Street, the gap in rich and poor. It's just their solutions are a little different than what we recommend. And I think the glue that holds it all together that I think both of them are missing is central banking and the Federal Reserve. The central bank basically finances all of the militarism around the world. The booms and busts in the economy that we are constantly seeing is fueled by central banking and manipulation of the interest rates. I highly recommend both of them to look into Austrian business cycle theory and, you know, not Glass-Steagall, like specific laws like that, which you beautifully said was not an issue. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what I found. First of all, I think it's important. You know, JFK really launched great questioning about the JFK assassination and moved a lot of people towards the thinking that the official line may not be correct. And as Oliver Stone pointed out at the beginning of the interview, there are a number of different books that have come out since the movie. And it's good to get this debate going. Clearly, we disagree with their views on getting government involved in domestic affairs, and they just don't seem to grasp that the same central power, the militarism that they're against in the foreign arena, causes the same kind of problems in the domestic arena. The bad guys just get in control, and they direct it towards themselves. But even further, even if there weren't bad guys, it's just a bad idea to eliminate market prices as a signal. And whenever you start getting the, the government involved, that means the market prices are gone, Decisions are made from a central planning point of view, and you get distorted markets and lack of creativity, which is coming uh, in healthcare very, very quickly, and it will make healthcare uh, problems in the United States much more severe as we go down the road. We're probably only halfway through the LBJ Great Society, which is really sad and really dangerous. Yeah, I agree with you. Every president seems to foist more and more weight on top of our shoulders, some of them more than others. LBJ was definitely one of the most pronounced. You could put him in with FDR. But I'll tell you, what was good about them is on the militarism stuff, they end really chastising Obama for his militarism, for the surveillance state, for the drones and all that. So I have to give him credit for that. As far as the foreign policy stuff, Justin Romindo this past week wrote a column on Stone and Kuznick and their take on the Soviet Union. Although it's clear and Stone and Kuznick are correct here, that the Cold War was really something that was really instigated by the United States. The Soviet Union was really just trying to control its own territory there. They had neither the wealth, the uh, military, or anything else to expand anywhere beyond their uh, geographic boundaries at that time. So uh, Stone and Kuznick may have something there. But as far as those 27 million deaths, I'm not sure how much of that came from actual military action and how much of that came from... Uh, Soviet policies that made it difficult for people to survive by getting food. So uh, that's for historians to discuss, though. Okay, that concludes Wrap Up with Rossini. Thanks, Chris. We'll talk to you next week. Great. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to The Robert Wenzel Show. This is Robert Wenzel. Be sure to check out my website, 
economicpolicyjournal.com, where I blog seven days a week about economics, finance, politics, and liberty. Executive producer of The Robert Wenzel Show is Chris Rossini. Head of editing and mastering is John Daubert. <laughs>